We turn in the Word of God to Psalm 13 tonight. This is our scripture reading and the text that we consider. This is the text that I preached last Sunday evening in the faith congregation. And before I read the passage, I gave a little explanation for selecting this text. So I'll do that for you as well. In the morning at faith last Sunday, I preached from a Lord's Day on the forgiveness of sins, Lord's Day 21, question answer 56. And that happened to fit well with the text that was next in our series in the book of Colossians. And that means then that I covered the Lord's Day and the next sermon in the series that I was preaching at faith. So that left me with what pastors call a free verse, selecting any text from the scriptures, which can be rather difficult for a pastor. And I decided to preach on Psalm 13, and the subject of the psalm is suffering. And if asked why preach on suffering, my general response is that Suffering is the lot of the people of God in this life. That's clear from many of the Psalms of David, especially where he talks much about going through affliction. And so it's always in order for us to hear the word of God about suffering. But I will admit that if pressed, though I don't want to get into any particular issue in the denomination or in anyone's life individually, the fact that Synod met and made some decisions concerning the issue of abuse was on my mind. On my mind are those who have been suffering because of abuse. Victims, victims' families, abusers, abusers' families. But also on my mind is the entire denomination. The issue of abuse has been somewhat divisive in our denomination and in connection with other things that have happened, thinking of a church split that has happened and the fact that it seems like for years and years now there have been wounds in our churches. We're still healing. We would like to move beyond things that are causing trouble, but we're still dealing with them. It seemed good to me to select a text that has to do with suffering and the word of God to us in our affliction. So Psalm 13, this is a Psalm of David according to the heading, but we believe the inspired word of God. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemy say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I shall sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Psalm 13 speaks to the fact of suffering. As the people of God in this life, we will have affliction. Shame on us if we in any way fall into the kind of thinking of the health and wealth gospel. I do have a concern about that. That we live in an affluent time. We live in a time when we have money and health and things 
well, we begin to think this way, should just go good. We shouldn't have any problems in our lives. And as a pastor, I do have a concern about this, that the scriptures warn us not to think it's strange when we go through fiery trials or have afflictions, but we as the people of God living in the United States in 2023 begin to think it is strange when something in my life doesn't go the way I want it to go. Then we need to take heed to the scriptures. We need to take heed to the Psalms of David. We need to recognize here was the man who was the king of the kingdom of Israel. He had a wealth far beyond the wealth of anyone here. He had a position in, of power and fame. He had everything from an earthly point of view. And yet, the Psalms show us that as a believer, David went through many troubles. He's the one, after all, who wrote Psalm 23 and talked about the valley under the shadow of death. That we suffer is not the issue. The important thing that we as the people of God need to face is this, how, how we suffer. We must not suffer as unbelievers. We must not suffer as atheists. The fool whom the Psalms do address, who says, there is no God. We must not suffer as those who have no faith or hope in God. We must suffer as believers. That's what we see here in Psalm 13. David, a believer who is suffering. And he writes Psalm 13 in a way that we, even as New Testament believers, are to identify with and say, here's the way to suffer as a believer. So we consider this text under that theme, suffering as a believer. And here are the three things that we see in this psalm. One, enduring difficult circumstances. And note that word, enduring. Not only do we suffer, but sometimes we suffer for a long time. Secondly, trusting God in prayer. Thirdly, singing to the Lord. And there you have it in a nutshell. If you are suffering now or you face suffering in the future and you say to yourself, now, how am I to go through this suffering? Recognize the reality of your suffering. Don't ignore it. You, you may acknowledge it. Secondly, go to the Lord in prayer. Thirdly, when you think about the Lord, sing to the Lord in your suffering. So we begin with the first point, enduring difficult circumstances. And as we look at this psalm, we begin looking at verses 1 through 4, and we recognize we could describe this as a complaint of David. This is David listing or going through what is troubling him in his life. And what we notice are three things here, especially, first of all, that David is dealing with difficult surrounding circumstances. He can say, in my life, there is something that I am dealing with that I don't want to deal with. There's something not having to do with me but with people around me that I, I would like them to go away. I would like them to stop troubling me. He speaks of enemies or an enemy in verse 2. How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? There's someone who hates me, someone who seems to have the upper hand. He's exalted over me. And he is mentioned again, in verse 4, the enemy who David is concerned might prevail against David, who troubles him, and who will rejoice if David is moved, if David is hurt. Specifically, Saul is probably reflecting on King Saul pursuing him. King Saul, not over a short period of time, but over a long period of time, a number of years, 
for such a long period of time that it seems to David like this is never going to end. Is this going to keep going and going and going? Where King Saul pursues me with his soldiers seeking to take my life. Where King Saul is spreading falsehood about me, lying about me, and troubling me. Now this is written for you and me to identify with David to say, I understand what he's saying here. This is not written for you to say, well, I've never been persecuted the way that David was at that time. I've never actually had an enemy going after me, spreading all kinds of rumors and lies about me. I've never had an enemy who was actually trying to take my life. No, Psalm 13 is written so that you and I will be able to say, even though the specific circumstances of David's life are different from mine, I'm able to look at what he's going through as a child of God, and I'm able to say, I understand that. And you can. Some of you, many of you maybe, right now, might be saying, yes, this is going on in my life in the home, in the family, the workplace, maybe even in the church setting, in the congregation, in the denomination. There is something going on in my life, in my outward circumstances of life, that is not according to my will. If things were going the way that I would want them to go, I would say, not that way. It causes me grief, pain. Maybe, and I don't use this word to get into all of the psychological nuances that might attach to this word, but maybe even depressed. Now, David ultimately, we know, would be delivered from Saul and would become, after Saul's death, the king of Israel. Nevertheless, even though David's suffering was not lifelong, I believe Psalm 13 is written by God to say, listen, I understand when you go through difficult trials over a long period of time, maybe even for the rest of your life. So that in the faith congregation, and I don't think anybody here will know who I'm talking about, so I can speak this way. I've had a couple who have gone through trial after trial after trial ask me, how long is this going to go on? And is it ever going to stop? You understand, David isn't simply saying here, this is what it's like to go through breaking your arm and wearing a cast for six weeks, and then after that your bones mend and the trial goes away. He's, he's identifying with the people of God who say, year after year, day after day, I'm dealing with this illness, and it's probably never going to go away. He wrote this psalm to identify with people who have lost a loved one and who face this reality. The pain of this loss is never going away. And so in the psalm, first of all, we can identify with David saying, this is the pain that I'm enduring, there's a circumstance in my life that is beyond my control and that is causing me trouble. Secondly, we notice that David is struggling. And he is honest about this before the Lord. He is taking counsel in his heart. He speaks of that in verse 2. I take counsel in my soul having sorrow in my heart daily. And what David is expressing is that though 
At the beginning of the psalm, he speaks of wondering how long the Lord is going to forget him. This all started, this struggle all started with his enemies coming against him, his enemies making his life miserable, his circumstances are difficult, and what he's doing is he's saying, and these outward circumstances, my earthly life and the painful things that are happening, it's affecting me spiritually. We have to be thankful that David is this honest. Sometimes we are not. And we sometimes put on the front that this is the way that we ought to deal with our difficult circumstances. I can go through this trouble and my faith remains strong. I can go through this and it doesn't make me question the Lord at all. It doesn't make me question my relationship to God. It doesn't affect my faith. I remain steadfast, trusting in the Lord, and I, I can put a smile on my face even as I go through a divorce, even as I go through the loss of a parent or a child. I can face anything and be strong in faith. David in Psalm 13 is showing us that's not the norm for the people of God. Now, I am not saying that David was perfect as he went through his trial and that he was without sin. But I don't think that we do justice to what we find here in Psalm 13 if we say that David admitting that he's spiritually weak is sinning. Rather, David is being honest. He's saying, this is what has happened. I've been going through this trial for a long period of time. Day after day, it doesn't get better. Week after week, it doesn't get better. And the reality is, is that I'm weak. The reality is I recognize that this poses a challenge to my faith. This, this brings out the, the weakness of my soul. He admits that he needs help and that he cannot handle the situation on his own. This too, beloved, is something that we ought to identify with. Something going on in my life, it's painful, it's too much for me to handle. It is a challenge to my faith. Sometimes I even struggle. Am I really a child of God? And that's the third thing that we notice here is that, first of all, in these difficult circumstances, David is, seeking, is experiencing difficult circumstances. Secondly, he's admitting his spiritual work, weakness. Thirdly, he confesses that he feels like the Lord is far from him. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? And again, David is being blunt and honest. And we ought to be thankful for that. Objectively, David, like us, could say by faith, I know that the Lord promises never ever to leave nor forsake his people, never to forget his people. And so David might say in this difficult circumstances in his life, I know then that it's not true that the Lord has abandoned me, period, end of story. But David's not a robot. David is a human being who thinks and feels and has emotions, and he's giving expression to the reality of what he's experiencing in this trial. It seems to me that this is the reality, that the Lord has abandoned me. Not only that he's against me, but when I look at my enemy and think that he has gotten the upper hand on me, it seems that the Lord is on his side and not my side. You ever felt that way? 
all these things, Jacob said, are against me. And that was him saying at one point in his life, it seems like the Lord is against me, forgotten me, is not kind to me, but is beating me down. That's distressing. But at the same time, we see here that David is suffering as a believer. Now we're going to come to that here in the second point of the sermon in a moment, but we can see that already here as he is describing his troubles. Do you see, first of all, that it's encouraging that David is thinking about the Lord? Think about how an unbeliever goes through troubles in his or her life. Who's it about? It's about them. And what are they concerned about? They're concerned only about the circumstances of their life. I don't like what's happening to me in my life, and what's happening to me in my life needs to change. And if things outwardly do not change, I'm going to be bitter and angry, and I'm not going to be happy. David, right away looking at what's going on in his life, is not only concerned about himself and how things are going on outwardly in his life, but he is concerned about his relationship to God. There, you see the believer in suffering. Apply this to your life. When you're going through an illness, you're going through a loss, you're going through a reversal, a hard time in your life. Remember immediately, I'm a believer, and I'm concerned about my relationship to God. Secondly, David is concerned about the glory and the welfare of God and of his church. I believe that's the right way to understand verse 4. David is concerned about the enemy prevailing against him, the enemy rejoicing when I am moved, not only because David is saying, I am concerned about myself being harmed and myself being put down, but we need to remember, David is the king. David represents God, the cause of God, the people of God. So that David's concern is not merely selfish here. But David's concern is, well, for the Lord, he's concerned if I am put down, my enemies defeat me, that's going to defame the name of the Lord. He's concerned about the welfare of Israel. If I as king am suffering and defeated, then this is going to harm the people of God as well. And so there too, you see a believer in suffering. I'm not just concerned about me, but the name of God and the welfare of the church. And then thirdly, and this brings us into the second point of the sermon, we see David here saying, the circumstances of my life are painful, they're bitter. But I'm going to turn to the Lord and trust Him in prayer. And so as we look at these first four verses, we not only see David bringing his complaint, explaining his suffering in the psalm, but where is David bringing his complaint to? To the Lord. This is a prayer. And even though verse 5 is a bit different, David is not there explaining his suffering. It is part of his prayer. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. And when we look at these first five verses from the perspective of a prayer, we see something beautiful in the progression through this prayer. David starts off suffering, expressing some doubts, some fears, and by the end of the prayer, he's confident, bold, ready to move on. And when we get to the end of the sermon, we're going to see ready to sing. And what does that indicate? That indicates that the believer experiences that God answers his prayer. In the midst of the suffering, David experiences the Lord whom he turns to, answering him, giving him comfort and courage and strength. So as we look at the prayer and we see, 
First of all, in verse 1, David is starting off weak. How long? Forever? Lord, will you hide your face from me and never look upon me again in kindness and favor? And yet, we recognize that he is looking to God. He's recognizing his need from the Lord. And then verse 2 also seems to be an expression of giving up, of David saying, I'm going to have to take counsel in my own soul, have sorrow in my own heart. I'm going to have to deal with things on my own. But then immediately in verse 3, he recognizes, no, I'm not going to deal with this in my own soul, in my own heart. I'm going to turn to God and notice no more questions, statements, confidence, even the boldness almost of a command. A child of God does that, you know, in prayer. Not because he thinks that he can tell God what to do, but because the child of God takes hold of the promises of God, takes hold of the word of God, takes hold of God saying, now when you are in trouble, I am your present help in that time of trouble. And I want you to come to me. I want you to ask. I want you to seek. I want you to knock. And when you come, I will answer you. I will open the door to you. You will find. And so it seemed to David before that the Lord didn't pay any attention to him in his life. He didn't pay any attention to him in his suffering. The Lord has turned his face away from me. He's forgotten to be kind to me, to take care of me. But now he comes with this. Consider, Lord, I'm, I'm calling upon you as the God of heaven to look at me. Take stock of my life and my situation. Look at me in my need. Give me strength. Give me help. And he's confident the Lord will do that and that the Lord will hear and answer him and give him strength. That's verse 4. Rather, verse 3. Consider and hear me at the beginning of that verse and then lighten mine eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. There, David is not simply saying this, wake me up physically, but he's giving expression to the trouble that he's experienced. Spiritually, Lord, I'm struggling. Spiritually, I'm groggy. Spiritually, I need rescue. Give me spiritual strength. And you and I need to identify with this too. Don't say tonight, well, of course, the Lord is going to hear David and take interest in him he is, after all, the king of Israel, the man after God's own heart. He has a special place in the covenant history of God's people. No, look at it from this point of view. Here's a man who is a mere man, a sinful and a weak man, and yet he's able to say, even me, the Lord will see me the Lord who knows all things in heaven and on earth will in a special way take regard for me. Look upon me in my need. Look upon my weakness, my need of strength. And when I lift up my lips, my sinful lips, in prayer, the Lord will give ear to me. Beloved, each one of you who has faith and believes on the Lord and salvation through Jesus Christ needs to say, this is me. I can say this to the Lord in prayer. My circumstances are troubling me. What's going on in my life is causing me pain and grief. Lord, look down upon me, even me, and hear me and give me the strength and the help I need. And the Lord will enlighten you. That is, he won't just open your eyes and make you awake physically. 
But in your need of faith, he will strengthen your faith to continue to cling to him. In your need for holiness, to not be moved from the way of the Lord, the Lord will strengthen you in holiness. And then it goes on in verse 4. And notice, though David speaks of the enemy having victory and rejoicing, that this is only a hypothetical. And he's praying to the Lord saying, don't let this happen, lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. And then he moves on immediately to verse 5. But I have trusted in thy mercy, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. David looks to the Lord and lays hold of, leans on, trusts in his mercy, literally his loving kindness. This is the word that is translated many other places in the King James Bible as loving kindness, but even that does not quite do justice to what this word means in the Hebrew. To translate it accurately, you would have to say this, I have trusted in thy steadfast loving kindness. Meaning that when David is dealing with a life that is constantly changing, dealing with himself as a human being who is constantly changing. I have changing emotions. I even have a, a changing spiritual condition. Sometimes I'm strong. Sometimes I'm weak. But I'm going to cling to the loving kindness of God that never changes. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. His love endures, his love for me. It doesn't matter even what's going on inside of me. I may be strong in my hope of the Lord, but there are many times where I'm not. I may be faithful in putting my, my faith, my trust in the Lord, but many times I am not. Yet the Lord loves me with a love that endures, a love that is unconditional, a love that is faithful. A love that forgives sins. A love that looks at us in our misery and says, I want your good. I want your salvation. This is a strong love. David says, I have trusted in thy mercy, thy loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. He understands that when God says, I love you, and I desire for you to be blessed, I desire for you to have good, that's not a mere wish on the part of God, but that this God of steadfast love is a God who accomplishes salvation for his people. Salvation from sin. Salvation from hell. Salvation from all the enemies, Saul, Satan, death, eternal punishment. Salvation, though, which we as the people of God have to recognize is not to be defined only in negative terms. David is, is laying hold on the fact that God, when he saves his people, he enriches us. He bestows many benefits upon us. He blesses us so that he can say, when I trust in the loving kindness of the Lord, I know I have the forgiveness of sins. I know that I have the promise of salvation through the Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that I have the hope of everlasting life. It's important for you and me to recognize that David is speaking of his faith, his trust, and his heart. internal spiritual virtues and activities. My life hasn't changed. 
My life hasn't gotten better. The enemy hasn't gone away. The evil that I'm in is still here. And yet, I have found comfort. By faith, I'm clinging to the Lord in his loving kindness. My heart is rejoicing in spiritual, not earthly, spiritual salvation. So that the psalm ends not with prayer, but a declaration, I will sing. I will sing, verse 6, unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Some look at Psalm 13 and say this is the way to look at the progression in the psalm. First, there's the suffering of the psalmist that causes him to sigh. Then he prays to God, and then he ends up not sighing anymore, but singing. Or for those of you who, like me, enjoy the writings of Charles Spurgeon, he says the psalm is a progression from howling, how long, howling, to singing. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I think that we should look at this psalm from two perspectives. And the first is, instead of a, a progression from sighing to singing or howling to singing, if I can put it this way, it's sighing and singing, howling and singing. When you look at Psalm 13, I don't think that this is one of those psalms where David writes in thanksgiving and joy from the perspective that my troubles are behind me. The Lord has delivered me now, I sing. Rather, I believe that here in Psalm 13, David is writing, I'm still in the midst of my trouble and my sorrow. I'm still sighing. I'm still crying. But I've gone to the Lord in prayer. And I have been reassured of his loving kindness, his salvation, that he's working all things for my good, so that while I am sighing, I am going to sing of my God, of his loving kindness and salvation. Beloved, what you face as a hurt tonight may still be hurting you tomorrow. What makes you cry today may still make you cry tomorrow. Your suffering might not have an end in sight. What will you do? Become bitter? Angry? Impatient? This psalm instructs you to look to the Lord in prayer. Put your faith in Him and His love and kindness and salvation through Jesus Christ so that you find that you have a hope in God. So that while you may, and you must really, admit your pain, don't ignore it, don't pretend it's not there. You're not Stoics, you're Christians. The Lord knows you're going through pain and sorrow. Then secondly, look to the Lord for help and strength through prayer. And then thirdly, while you're suffering, sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with you. His loving kindness and salvation through Jesus Christ. And do you see not only David in this? Do you see not only your calling in this? Do you see also the Lord Jesus Christ? Beloved, ultimately, when we go to the Psalms, we need to see that the writer of the Psalms is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that these Psalms reflect upon his experience. 
Is he not the one who for, for 33 years in his life went through suffering? Is he not the one who was the man of sorrows? Is he not the one who faced many enemies, Satan himself, the Pharisees, many wicked people in the world? And is he not the one who could say, how long? How long? Seems like my whole life. It was his whole life. And then finally, beloved, we know that on the cross, Jesus could say it not only feels like the Lord has forgotten me, abandoned me, but the Lord did forsake him. That he might be punished for our sins. At that moment, perhaps you might say, on the cross there, he didn't sing, he didn't rejoice. And yet, when you look through the gospel accounts, our Lord Jesus Christ, the suffering Savior that he was, he believed all the promises of God. He was assured that he would, through the loving kindness of God, accomplish salvation, not for himself, but for his people. He didn't want to go to the cross, but knowing that that way of suffering would bring salvation, he went with sorrow and singing. We want to be like David. We want to be like our Lord Jesus Christ. And through our suffering, sing to the Lord. But we should also look at this psalm from the perspective of our hope for the future. That's how we ought to look at verse 6. It's telling us in this life, I do believe that David was saying in this life, even though Throughout the rest of my life, I may have suffering. I will sing to the Lord. But David is also looking to the future. Someday, I will sing, and I will not sigh. I will sing, and I will not howl. Someday, I will only have things to sing about and nothing to cry about. One day, our sighing and all of the circumstances of this life that causes us to sigh will be gone. Don't you look forward to that day? Here in a world full of political corruption, that's really what David was experiencing. Someday all that's going to be gone. All the corruption of Washington, all the corruption of Lansing, wiped away. David was living as we do in a world full of moral corruption. Someday that's going to go away. And all the evil that surrounds us is going to surround us no more. All the evil within us is going to be done away with. All the enemies, Satan, the wicked world, our sinful natures, gone. There's going to come a day when death will be vanquished and cause no more sorrow, when sickness and disease will be done away with and cause no more pain or suffering. There's going to come a day when there won't be any division in marriage between husband and wife. There won't be any division or strife between parents and children. There won't be any strife or division in the church, the family of God. When Christ shall come and share his life and all his glory with us, then we will sing and never cry again, the Lord has dealt bountifully with me. May God grant that in your suffering, you trust him in prayer and find your hope and comfort so that you may sing. Amen. Father in heaven, remember us, but even more we pray, remember thy name and the glory that thou dost deserve. And remember the church and the need of the church for peace and help and strength. 
Therefore, Lord, we pray that if it is thy will that thou wilt deliver us from our trials, difficulties, in our personal lives, in our family lives. But even more, Lord, we pray that if it is thy will for us to suffer, and there are various things that we as thy people suffer in this world, that thou wilt give unto us faith, and that thou wilt give unto us holiness. And our desire, Lord, is not for our own welfare, happiness, to have a trouble-free life. But our desire, Lord, is that we would not sin against Thee or against the other members of the church, that nothing we do would do any harm to Thy name or to the peace and the unity of the church or to do damage to any of the members of the church in their faith and walk with Thee. Lord, grant that we may suffer as believers weak and sinful in ourselves, but enlightened, strengthened by thy loving kindness and salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.